All right, so this is a real quick video, impromptu video, one of my unscripted videos. Um, but I wanted to share this information because obviously what's going on uh, in the stock market, um, being October, being an election year, this can be one of your good friends, Stock Traders Almanac. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at October, as you can see here. We're going to go through some of those tenants that they have in October. But one of the things I want to cover, because really, as I develop things in this channel, uh, I'm an ETF guy. Been an ETF guy for a long time. When they first came out, uh, I know when I was uh, first a broker back in um, 2007, 2008, when I first got into the industry and this thing called ETFs was was the new kid on the block, right, for investment products. And I used to always talk to my old boss and say, hey, look, I think ETFs are just, they're going to take over. Like mutual funds, they cost too much. They're not as efficient because you can't trade them uh, intraday. Uh, they have a net asset value, which means that you only see the value after all the stocks have settled in the mutual fund at the end of the day. So you can only trade it at that point in time or you're going to trade on the previous day's uh, information. So that's uh, it's kind of sucky. Um, so it's a more liquid product, but we want to look at ETF because there's some advantages and disadvantages, but uh, we want to look at ETFs as being uh, an alternative for people that just like to try and day trade, which is fine. It's nothing wrong with day trading, especially if you're really trying to learn the market. Um, but most people, they don't have that time. If you have a 401k, you know, and a pension and you have a deferred compensation plan that you put money in, um, the ETFs is going to be your probably most efficient and cost effective way to invest that money because most people just don't win most fund managers do not win uh, i want to set that to rest off the gate so we're going to look at the spiva report if you're not familiar with the spiva report you don't have to have a login some of the services that you're going to see me in you're going to have to have a login you got to pay money you know i'll probably end up be spending somewhere between 150 to 300 dollars a month just on services that you see sometimes when you um are viewing some of my videos not on that one service but a multitude of services from different uh websites but this is completely free so this is on s p global so what is the speed report speed report is just a report that shows how fund managers uh produce their gains in relation to a benchmark so a benchmark if you're not familiar with that benchmark something like the s p 500 or the dow 30 right that's a large cap uh benchmark Okay, the Dow 30 is more of a blue chip benchmark. But the funny thing is, historically, if you look at the S&P 500 and the Dow, they both uh, correlate very closely. Okay, usually within uh, a percent or so of each other in terms of how they move. But I digress. So what we want to look at is, as you can see, it says in the United States. So this is a percentage of all domestic funds that underperformed S&P 5 uh, composite 1500. Now, what's the S&P uh, composite 1500? So as you can see here, this is on S&P Global's website. It's just not coming off the top of my head with some BS. Uh, the S&P Com Composite 1500 combines three leading indices, the S&P 500, which of course you know is a large cap, the S&P Mid Cap 400, and the S&P Small Cap 600 to cover approximately 90% of U.S. market capitalization. So what it's basically saying is that it's giving you access and exposure to 90% of the stock market. OK, the U.S. stock market. Right. So this is the index that they're using as the benchmark. So as you can see, we're looking at the one year right here, right down here, one year. So in the United States, 76.17 percent of funds underperformed the S&P 5, uh, S&P composite, uh, uh, composite 1500. OK, 76 percent. All right. Think about that. That means that 20, the, the remaining 23.83 percent of funds outperformed the S&P composite, but that's looking over one year. OK, now you have to consider, do you think that you can beat the market? Do you think that you're going to be in this 23 <laughs> percent? No, you're not. OK, I'm not right. I know better. OK, I know that I can't beat the market. You can beat the markets in some instances in some periods of time. But unless you're a guy like Stanley Druckenmiller or uh, a Ray Dalio, good luck. OK, you're not going to beat the market on a consistent basis. Most people just will not. OK, 
If fund managers can't do it, okay, what makes you think you can do it? Okay, these are people that do this full time. They're sitting in front of a computer. They're having meetings. Sometimes they're getting uh, privy to information that you'll, you'll never get because they're actually getting inside information and they still can't beat the market, okay? That's one year. We go to the three year. That percentage goes up to 90%. 90% underperform. Look at the five year, okay? 85% long year, long duration, 10 year, 90%. Okay. If you're investing for retirement, the, the reality is this, okay. Especially as people get, get older and medical technology advances, you are not, okay. You are not going to outperform the market. Okay. Because guess what? People that do this as a full-time job, most of them don't even outperform the market. Okay. So where do you get the gall thinking that you're going to do that for that sustained period of time? Let's say the average person works 35, 40 years, okay? And then they retire, right? If you're retired, okay, that period of time that you're putting your money away, that you're trying to outperform the market, you have such a statistical hurdle in front of you, it's not even funny. It's, it's not a game. Okay, you do not want to turn around and say, oh man, I've invested all this money, but I've only gotten 3% return on my, I mean, 3%, that, that's what the rate of inflation is. So really, and then when you account for taxes, you actually lost money, right? So when you can account inflation and taxes, you've lost money, okay? So I just wanted to show that because a lot of people think they can just, you know, be some guru. They think they're just going to be the, they think they're going to be the 9.92% right here that that outperforms the market and it's, it's you're not okay so just stop playing with your stop having mental gymnastics with yourself um one of the things that you got to understand the etfs too so this of course this is a paid service vetify is a really good service etf database and the reason i'm a fan of etfs is because you can diversify have a diversified portfolio of etfs and cover a broad market you can cover specific sectors industries they're a great tool Okay, everybody at the base of your portfolio, it should be comprised of ETFs. For the average person, it's not going to be smart for you to try and do that for individual stocks for a long-term portfolio. Okay, um, but you want to be able to have services like this, like that you invest in, if you're going to be swing trading, you know, or if you're going to be trading, you know, on a quarterly basis, or you're going to be sector rotation trading. Sector rotation, you're just going into different uh, sectors. You know whether it be energy or uh, defense or consumer uh, consumer discretionary, whatever it is, you you want to have some intel. You know, right? You want to know what the flow is that's going in and out. So, for example, when we look at this. This is the Spiders S and P five hundred ETF trust, right? So, it's probably the biggest ETF that's that's out there. Okay, um, because it's it's going after a broad market market index. So as you can see, though, year to date, $13 billion, of course, as you can see, fund flows in the millions. So $13 billion right here has gone in year to date into that ETF. OK, but in the last week, OK, th today is October 10th. Yeah, today is October 10th. You can see in the last week, $11 billion has gone out of that ETF, right? That's something that's needs to be paid attention to. Okay. Why? Well, let's look at it. So pulling out the almanac. So October almanac. So beware. Now I'm just reading this straight from the book. I'm, I'm not making this up. I'm not in, interjecting my own opinion in this uh, per se. This is, this is straight from the book. Okay. Some of the key points. Beware October phobia from crashes in 1929, 1987. 554 point drop October 27, 1997. Back to back massacres, 1978 and 1979. Friday the 13th, 1989. And the 2008 meltdown, right? So October can be rough. Okay. That's what it's telling you. But that's not the full story. Okay. Yet, uh, yet October is a bear killer and turned the tide in 13 uh, instances post World War II bear markets 1945 1957 
60, 62, 66, 74, 87, 1990, 98, 2001, 2002, 2011, and 2022. Okay. First October Dow top uh, is in uh, 2007. Worst six months of the year ends with October. Okay. So that's not that's that's comforting news right to say okay well maybe there's um there's light at the end of the tunnel where whatever purge has been happening in the market now is going to end okay um uh let's see where is he having here uh october is a great time to buy basically that's what it's saying it's had some tumultuous times but it's saying that ultimately october is a good time to buy uh big october dow gains five uh five years 1999 through 2003 after atrocious septembers right so basically saying between 1999 and 2003 september wiped people out okay but then october came back with a bang or as they like to call it shocktober right <laughs> so um see october 2022 20, best down month by points up over 4,000, okay, or 14%, right? So there's hope for October, right? Or Shocktober, right? So just because we see these funds coming out right now, right, doesn't mean that it's just going to be all bad. But you need to be able to pay attention to stuff like this, right? Because these are just general statistics. This is not going to be specific. It, it's not forward teaching. It's just backwards looking. But I always tell people, you, you cannot expect to jump into a car Put up with your windshield visor and look in the rear view mirror to use your as as your uh, ability to go ahead and drive. That that's that doesn't work well for you. Okay. Um, one last thing. Finish this up. I'm not trying to make this a huge long video. Um, Want to go over some of the because um, I think most of you know the advantages of ETFs. If not, uh, let's just go through some of them as you can see. Um, of course, diversification trades like a stock means it means it's liquid, lower fees. Woo wee! I'm gonna do a whole video on fees because fees can destroy. I mean, destroy a retirement account. Okay. Um, immediately reinvest the dividends, limited capital gains tax, lower discount on a premium price. Okay, disadvantages. So less diversification says for some. Uh, for some sectors of foreign stocks etf investors might be limited to large cap stocks due to a narrow group of equities in the market index a lack of exposure to mid cap and small cap companies could leave potential growth opportunities out uh, of the reach of certain etfs right so that's where you would go into something like what well you look at this composite right because what is that composite it's the small cap mid cap and large cap right so that's where you can take advantage of that that's where you can overcome that disadvantage very easily uh, intraday pricing might cause uh, unwise trading and that's basically they're just saying that you there may be a um a inclination to try and trade this like like you would like a regular stock like day trading which for etfs that doesn't really make sense you, you're defeating the purpose of the of the the instrument cost could be higher depending on it yes because you do have actively managed actively manage uh etfs so yeah maybe it's on par with the cost of a actively managed mutual fund in terms of the cost most likely it's not but it could be uh lower dividend yields skewed leveraged etf return so a lot of times people try and double triple down if you use direction uh or pro shares you know they have the inverse etfs where you can like go say hey i want to I, I believe the market is going to tank tomorrow so let's go ahead and go negative the s p times three and then bam it has the best day it's had in three months right so you, you get negatively affected by those so you have to watch out for those leverage etf products they can be good but they are not i repeat they are not meant to be held long term okay they tell you that on the product when you read the disclosure it tells you that these are not items that are meant to be hold at held actually longer than a day okay all right so just wanted to go over some of this stuff uh because it is important and a lot of times you get a lot of fluff you get a lot of youtubers that are just that they're youtubers they don't have any financial backgrounds 
They didn't work in the industry. They're just learning a lot of this stuff. And then they're just like, wow, I heard that, you know, YouTube is a great place to make money talking about financial things because this, you know, has a high, um, high ad rate in terms of what they pay out on it or something like that. So, um, that's why I tell you, you know, this is, none of this is financial advice. Okay. I'm not a financial advisor. I am a licensed insurance agent and a former stockbroker for a number of years. And I just like to cover these things uh, for educational purposes, edutainment purposes. Hopefully you get a little bit entertained, try and not be so uh, so uh, textbook with everything in terms of how I'm gonna present it. You know, what you wanna present with some something to keep you awake, right? So, um, but yeah, none of this is financial advice, but this is, financial education, because these are things that you need to know, you need to understand. Sometimes financial advisors are not gonna tell you this. They're not, they're gonna take your money, but they're not going to tell you this. A good financial advisor is going to equip you because a good financial advisor knows that if they equip you to be a smarter investor, okay, you can actually, they will actually feel more comfortable taking different strategy approaches with you. But you have to remember, Financial advisors are very risk averse with their clients' money because guess what? They don't want to get sued. And ultimately, they don't want to lose your money because they want to make you more money because if they're making you more money, then that means they're making themselves more money, okay? So just keep that in mind. Uh, of course, there are bad actors out there, but hey, that's the industry. There's bad actors in everything, right? It doesn't matter if you work in a city job, doesn't matter if you're a janitor, right? It's, it, there's plenty of people that perform bad at their job, right? But there's also plenty of people that perform well at their job. So keep those things in contact, uh, keep those things in, uh, keep those things in mind. I um, think that's it. I don't want to show anything else because uh, I want to try and keep this fairly short. But yeah, check those things out. Go to Vetify. Uh, they also have a free uh, trial that you can do. It's like a 14 day trial. Uh, if you're an advisor, it's like a 30 day trial that you can sign up for. But I know most people are not going to be advisors that are looking at this. Again, like I said, this is not financial advice. This is just giving you some financial in insight and education on how to kind of pick things apart and some tools that you can use to help you decipher what's a good investment. Peace.